I'm skeptical of the claim. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. A careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skeptical. 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 Of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for, for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination. 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 Of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. If you found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it. Unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language, even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language. A language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. In addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack, access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. The big discovery of the 1950s and 60s was that the DNA molecule encodes information right. in a roughly digital or alphabetic or typographic form. This why, do you, was, why do you use the term digital? Well, because in computer science we have characters. You know, zeros and ones. I see. I see. This, this, was, this is Crick, 1957. It's the sequence hypothesis. He realized that, that the information in DNA, or the, the, the chemical subunits of DNA called nucleotide bases, were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or like the zeros and ones in a section of computer code. It, that is to say, it's not, it wasn't their chemical properties that gave them their function, but rather their specific arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention, which was later explicated in the form of what we call the genetic code. So we had genetic text functioning according to a code. So it really As was a pure, it was, it was pure information. It, it, this is a genuine information storage system. Crick, by the way, was a code breaker in World War II. Oh. So th this is a fascinating, is an application of the information sciences to molecular biology. Now what we, this is, and this is the argument that I make, is that what we know from experience is that information, whether we find it in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or uh, information embedded in a radio signal or in a section of computer code, whenever we find information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. 
So if we, if we, from a materialistic evolutionary standpoint, don't have any explanation for the origin of the information that's necessary to build new biological form. And yet we do know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, of a source of information, of a cause of the origin of information. That, that cause is intelligence or mind. And so what I've argued in both Darwin's doubt and signature in the cell is that what we're seeing in life is evidence of the activity of a directing mind in the history of life. So Paul Davies, a physicist from ASU, says, we are still left with the mystery of where biological information comes from. If the normal laws of physics can't inject information, and if we are ruling out miracles, which of course they are, then, then how can life be predetermined and inevitable rather than a freak accident? How is it possible to generate random complexity and specificity together in a law-like manner? We've always come back to that basic paradox. How do you get this by staying in the room? Well, I, I describe a couple of ways people try to get it. One thing you can do is simply say, oh, it's just chance. You do it long enough, hard enough, these things will happen by chance. But that really misunderstands the level of information involved. Or you can argue that there's some natural law that could cause information. Give me an example of that. You won't. There are no, are no examples of natural law ever giving you nothing, anything more than statistical information, the lowest level of information. So if you want to stay inside the room, you're going to have to go by chance or by law. Those things don't work. Why? Because we're seeing true information in the room. And that means you've got to have a source of true information, and that's got to get you outside the room. That's the problem. So here's the problem with asking these questions. I ask these questions all the time in homicides, but I don't stop here. I don't ask these questions and stop. If I did that, I'd never solve a case. The next question I have to ask is the money question. It's a who question. All these questions point to the who question. If I refuse to ask a who question, then trust me, you're never going to get an answer. So the folks who are doing origin of life, they don't want to ask any who questions. Can't be a who. Has to be a what. That's why you can't solve this, folks, because it's a who you're looking for. And this is what Warren Getz says about that. He says, yeah, you're looking for a who. A necessary requirement for generating meaningful information is the ability to select from alternatives. And that requires intelligent volitional entity because unguided random processes cannot do this. Not in any amount of time because this selection process demands continuous guidance by intelligent beings that have a purpose. That's how you get information. We've all heard the theory that chimps are close human relatives, but is there any truth to that? Secular scientists claimed in the 1970s that chimp genomes are 98% similar to humans, and it was apparently verified by more modern techniques. But that estimate actually used isolated segments of DNA that we already share with chimps, not the whole genomes. The latest comparison to include all of the DNA between the two species revealed only a 70% identity, a huge difference from what scientists have been claiming for years. Nothing, we have almost everything, almost overnight, geologically speaking. This remains mysterious. Nobody really understands how this happened. In Darwin's theory, if you think of the branching tree, Darwin's branching tree, the common ancestor down here and the different modern forms of animals up here, you would have one form to begin with and then it would gradually diverge into slightly different forms and more and more different until you get the major differences that we see now. The problem with the Cambrian explosion is that all these major differences appear together at the same time with no fossil evidence that they descended from this common ancestor. You have a sudden emergence of new biological form and structure and the suddenness of it defies the Darwinian mechanism's ability to produce new structure. Darwin believed that his mechanism must act slowly through small, gradual, incremental changes. And as a result, he expected to find 
many transitional intermediate forms from the very simplest organisms to the first animals. Darwin knew about the Cambrian fossil record and he considered, considered it a, a serious problem for his theory. He hoped that future fossil collecting would fill in the gaps somewhat and uh, make the theory more plausible. But in fact, 150 years of continued fossil collecting have made the problem worse. Many more types of animals were involved than Darwin knew about. Located in the province of Yunnan in southern China, Xinjiang has some of the world's best preserved fossils from the Cambrian era. Darwinism helps them maybe only telling a part story for evolution. According to Chen, the fossils he's discovered turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. Darwin's tree, you know, uh, reverse condition, very unexpectedly, our research convincing uh, major phyla starting down below at the beginning of Cambrian. Base is white, gradually narrow, so this is almost uh, turned down differently. But then a completely new fundamental property of the universe was discovered. An anti-gravity force present in space itself. It is called the cosmological constant. And when cosmologists calculated its effect on the evolution of the universe, they realized it had to be very finely tuned indeed. No force in the history of cosmology has ever been discovered to be that finely tuned. The cosmological constant needs to be set to one part in a trillion, 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 trillion. Otherwise the universe would be so drastically different that it would be impossible for us to evolve. That the cosmological constant arrived at such a tiny value by chance seemed to be out of the question. But the alternative explanation was also impossible to contemplate. There should be no reason why the luck should just have it that we can exist. It's too much, it's, it's a stretch, it's much too far to stretch. I see two things when I look at nature. I see evidence of design, or aboriginal design. Aboriginal and, meaning? From the beginning, you know, ah, in, right. different, in different groups of organisms. From but, the get-go. But you also see evidence of decay. And that's also something that's consistent with what de when designers make things, then there's we, this thing we call entropy. And I think here a theological perspective does help because I think you, if, uh, from the Judeo-Christian perspective, you would expect to see both evidence of, of original creation or original design, but you would also expect to see that something's gone wrong in nature as well. And I think we see both. So my, my theological perspective does inform my ability to answer that question about the things in nature that don't look so well. Uh, it's interesting, uh, for example, the problem of virulent uh, bacteria, you know, nasty, nasty bugs. They are, the, the, they are invariably the result of a loss of information as a result of the mutational process. So the very process that the Darwinists have invoked to explain the origin of good design is actually, I think, responsible for the, the evidence of decay. So I think there is a, the, this is the question in uh, philosophy known as the theodicy, you know, the... Yes, yes, yeah. the problem with pain. And so I, I think there's ways of thinking about that, but, I, but, but for me, the, the evidence of design is powerful, it's ubiquitous in, in both in life and at the level of physics of things like the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics. So I, I see a very powerful signal of design, but I don't deny the decay and the suffering in the world, and I, I have a theological way of understanding if that. The, if the, if the, the bad viruses are always a result of def that fits the theology perfectly. Which the theology suggests that good is the entity. Evil has no independent existence. It's always a defect or a shortcoming in the good, right? Isn't that right? I think it does fit. And, okay. and there's well, quite a lot of microbiology that actually supports that, that viewpoint. Darwin created a 19th century local theory without looking at extreme cases that was reasonably successful for breeders, for the explanation of local characteristics like beak size or the growth of wings, but he entirely failed to explain what he thought he was explaining, 
the emergence of biological complexity on the species level or higher order levels. He wasn't able, it was a premature question to address an audience about the origin of species. He couldn't say anything about what he did not know. This is C.S. Lewis. Granted that reason is prior to matter, I can understand how men should come to know a lot about the universe they live in. If, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology, and for scientific cosmology, we may as well read the Darwinian theory of evolution. If I swallow the scientific co cosmology, then not only can I not fit in religion, but I cannot even fit in science. If minds are wholly dependent on brains, and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry on the meaningless flux of the atoms, I cannot understand how the thought of those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees.